Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, New York 14th. My name is Diego de la Torre, and I'm with the Office of Congresswoman um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you so much for joining our town hall. Just a few notes of housekeeping before we begin. If you are logged into the Zoom meeting, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. We prioritize questions from constituents uh, from New York 14th, so please mention your name and your neighborhood. Alternatively, you can email your questions to aoc.townhall at mail.house.gov or call 718-662-5970. Our staff is also available to support with any technical difficulties. Our team members will be monitoring the inbox and our phones. We are also live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, so please feel free to visit our pages for the live stream. CAR Open Captions is being provided by All Hands in Motion. If you click the link in the chat, it will take you to a website where you can view the transcription. As a reminder to our speaker this evening, please speak slowly so our interpreters can interpret to the best of their abilities. For today's town hall, we will hear from New York State Assembly members Soran Mamdani and Kenny Burgos on the state of the budget negotiations in Albany and how the budget will impact you. Then we'll hear from the Congresswoman on behalf uh, on benefits for constituents from the Inflation Reduction Act. We will then open it up to Q&A from constituents. Our first speaker of the evening is Assembly Member Zoran Kwame Mamdani. As representative for New York's 36th Assembly District, covering Astoria, Ditmar Steinway, and Astoria Heights, Assembly Member Mamdani is the first uh, South Asian man elected to the chamber and a champion of publicly owned utilities, MTA reform, and ending cash bail. I now invite Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani to give his remarks. Thank you so much, Diego, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Zoran Mamdani, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to spend five minutes just giving a bit of an intro to the state budget and then passing it over to my colleague, Assemblymember Kenny Burgos. So to start with, the state budget is due April 1st of every year. And as you can tell, we are getting into a place of being more than a few weeks behind that. The reason that we are delayed at this time is because Governor Hochul is trying to roll back the landmark bail reforms that were introduced and passed in 2019. And what that means in a very kind of plain language is that Governor Hochul wants to eliminate the current stipulation in our laws that instructs judges to use the least restrictive framework to bring someone accused of a crime back to court. She wants to eliminate that and she wants to give judges more discretion to set bail. The issue with that is that we know that bail is a tool that disproportionately harms poor New Yorkers as well as New Yorkers who are black and brown. And the reason for that is that the average bail being set in New York State today is more than $30,000. So for many people, what this means is if you are poor, you stay in pretrial detention before you've been found guilty. But if you're rich, you pay your bail and you go home until your trial. And I've recently visited Rikers Island, which is actually within Assemblymember Kenny Burgos's district, and I know he'll speak about it more. And we have thousands of New Yorkers, close to 6,000 New Yorkers, who are on that island the vast majority of whom have not been convicted of a crime, but are simply unable to pay bail. So we are fighting tooth and nail in Albany to ensure that Governor Hochul does not get her way and roll back bail reform and then put more poor black and brown New Yorkers into pretrial detention. Two of the other major focuses that we have in the state budget at this time is our campaign to fix the MTA. As many New Yorkers know, the MTA is the lifeblood of New York City. And right now we have an opportunity to resolve some of the core issues of that authority. And one of them is we need faster and more frequent service. We are fighting to get trains and most buses to a level of six minute service. And that would be done by providing funding, whether from 150 million to $300 million from the state budget towards getting us that kind of frequency. The other major uh, point that we are advocating for in Albany that is in the negotiations is a free bus pilot program. This would be a program that would make two bus routes per borough free across New York City. So that would be 10 bus routes in total. And the reason that we're pushing for free buses is that we've seen in Boston, in Kansas City, in the state of Connecticut, in parts of LA, that when you have free buses, you have buses that go faster, you have buses that are safer, and you have buses that are universally accessible. And I say that because in Boston, 
Buses had a 23% decrease in dwell time when they became free because when people came on the bus, they didn't have to swipe their Metro car or their Omni. In Kansas City, when they implemented free buses, there was a 39% drop in assaults because when you don't have an interaction around the fare box, there's a lot less tension between riders and operators. And universally accessible because buses are the only way that any New Yorker can get around New York City, especially with the lack of elevators in so many of our train systems. And if we take away the obstacle of the fare, something that already is impacting 20% of low-income New Yorkers' ability to travel for a job opportunity, a medical appointment, then it means that everyone can get to those things. The final thing that I would flag is we are fighting for the Build Public Renewables Act, which in short form is known as the BPRA. And this will connect to something that Congresswoman will talk about with the Inflation Reduction Act. But in, in short, what BPRA does is it ensures that We've passed landmark climate legislation in New York State. We've said that by 2030, 70% of our grid needs to be renewable. And what this act says, that if private companies can't get us to that metric that we know the planet needs, that our district needs, then public entities like the New York Power Authority will step in and will build that remaining set of construction to get us to that 70% renewable. And it'll do so by having labor protections, by being democratically controlled, and by having a mandate to do an annual review and build every single year. So those are some of the updates of what we're fighting for in Albany. That's why the budget is late. And I'm gonna pass it over to Kenny to tell you a little bit more about some of the other priorities that we have. Thank you for your remark, Assemblymember. Uh, our next speaker is Assemblymember Kenny Burgos. Um, he's represent representative for New York's 85th Assembly District, covering Soundview, Longwood, and Rikers Island. The Assemblymember is a champion of good cause eviction, closing Rikers, and increasing the minimum wage. I now invite Assemblymember Kenny Burgos to give his remarks. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, first off, thank you to the Congressman for having me. Like you said, my name is Kenny Burgos, lifelong Bronx and representative for the eastern portion of the Bronx in the state of New York. Uh, I want to pick up where my colleagues around left off in the beginning on bail, uh, because it really is probably the cornerstone piece of why the budget is late. Uh, but I want to speak a little bit about what these bail rollbacks would look like in reality. Um, as he mentioned, Rikers Island is within my district, I've visited several times and, I, and I've seen the conditions there. And if you've seen even just through the news, it's no question that Rikers Island is, a, is in a humanitarian crisis. Uh, and what these rollbacks would do is only increase the population of a pretrial detention center that we have already deemed uh, horrendous and to be shut down by 2027. So not only would this proposal delay and essentially maybe even block the closure of Rikers Island, which New York City has already mandated into law, this would then put more of my neighbors, your neighbors, poor people and people of color into an island uh, that it frankly can be a death sentence and it has been for dozens of people and it continues to be every year. Uh, so I just want to lend my voice to the support of not rolling, the, not rolling back their reform and to the point that Iran made. Now, I want to talk about another important issue in the budget that's also holding us up, arguably the most important and an issue that impacts every single one of us here on this call, housing. So there's a lot of discussions around housing and how we're going to address the housing crisis here in New York State. Uh, a lot of great proposals and a lot of opposition to some of them. One of the biggest pieces this year of uh, legislation that I'm pushing for and many of my colleagues are is something called good cause eviction. Uh, and what is good cause eviction? So good cause eviction is a response to what we've seen throughout the state. If you've had a lease expire and a landlord hits you with a new lease with an increased rent of 30, 40, or 50%, or even more, this is what good cause aims to protect. Good cause aims to keep people within their homes and only allows them to be evicted with good cause or any de facto evictions, which are essentially evictions based on rent increases. Good cause evictions would prohibit and basically uh, prohibit landlords of market rate units from increasing the rent over 3% or 150% of consumer price index, whichever is greater. Now, what does that really mean? Well, if it was if good cause was enacted, let's say before last year, that means landlords would have been able to increase rents nearly 10% because CPI is conducted with inflation. And we saw, we all saw inflation, its impact at the grocery store with utility bills, 
Um, so this still accounts for landlords and increased costs in just operating their home, but it protects tenants and keeps tenants within their home um, and from further contributing to the homeless crisis that we're having. What are some other myths that go on within good cause eviction is that landlords feel as if they're losing control of their property. Uh, and the reality is that good cause allows you access to your unit if you need it for yourself, for a spouse, uh, for a family member, and family member is very broadly defined up until even uh, a mother-in-law, so to speak. So one of the, you know, we're pushing very heavily for good cause eviction this year because I think it's a much, much needed piece of legislation to protect tenants and renters all throughout New York State and New York City. Uh, but it's obviously not the only tool we have to address the housing crisis. Uh, the governor has actually proposed something called the Housing Compact. And what, it, what that is, is the governor is proposing to build over 800,000 units of housing over the next decade here in New York State. But through that, she's uh, proposing to have communities within New York City, downstate New York City, to build 3% housing every year and communities outside to build 1% housing every year. Now, there's been a lot of opposition from upstate and the Long Island area for reasons that are pretty obvious. Um, you know, we've seen uh, redlining policies, you know, discriminatory policies, segregation, you know, create the neighborhoods that we see today in some of these neighborhoods. And their fear is to lose what they call local control of their housing, because part of the housing compact says if you do not fulfill these requirements, the state can then come in and override and make sure we're actually building that kind of housing. Uh, I think this is a crucial piece of legislation, however it does land, uh, because the reality is we have to build more housing. One of the biggest issues here in New York State is that we have created so many jobs and attracted so many people to our state, but we have not nearly built the adequate amount of housing to accommodate that. And that's why we have this increase in rent. Obviously, we also need protections uh, in law, like good cause eviction, to prevent that. But naturally, if you have a higher demand for housing and not enough, the price is going to go up. So that's uh, the housing compact from the governor. One quick thing on uh, NYCHA, because I know we may have a lot of NYCHA tenants here as well, and I represent a lot of NYCHA as well as a congresswoman, um, is we're pushing this year to put in something called NYCHA ERAP. If you remember during the COVID-19 pandemic, the state put out one of the best policies ever, which was the Emergency Rental Assistance Program known as ERAP. And that helped to keep people in their homes. If you fell back on rent, if you lost your job and you couldn't pay the bills, the state came in, paid the rent to the landlord, and kept people housed problem is that we left out people in public housing. And that is just completely not right. So what we're trying to do is fill uh, is to essentially land the plane of all the back to rent for people who are living in public housing throughout the state of New York, and just to pay those backed up rent rolls and get everyone up to speed. Uh, so that's a big push that I'm making this year. The state right now, we're proposing $389 million uh, to help fulfill that gap. And we're also looking for the city of New York to fulfill the remaining gap. Last, I'm going to leave you with uh, another super important issue, as they all are, and that's minimum wage. We've been talking about cost increases. We've been talking about how expensive it is to live here in New York City. And it is no question and no secret that there is not a single place in this country that you can live in a one-bedroom home on minimum wage. Even here in New York State, where we have a $15 an hour minimum wage that we fought so hard for, right now, it quite frankly, just isn't enough. So the good news is that although the budget has not been passed, I can confidently say the minimum wage will be going up. And why do I say that? That's because not only did the assembly propose a minimum wage increase, the Senate proposed a minimum wage increase, but the governor herself proposed a minimum wage increase. Now, we all just have different ways of, of addressing it, but the wage will go up. And I'll just quickly leave you with the three proposals, and those are... The governor right now is proposing to raise the minimum wage to a minimum of $16.39 between now and 2026, and then indexing it to the rate of inflation or 3%, whichever is less. Now, we in the legislature, being the Assembly and the Senate, have a similar proposal, but a little bit different. So we're actually pushing to raise the wage to $21.25. I'll be, I'll be honest. I think that's the better plan um, by 2026 and then index it with inflation. Um, so we're big. We're pushing big on, on minimum wage increases on housing and pushing back on bail reform. And that's what I want to leave you with on the state budget. Thank you so much. Apologies. Uh, thanks so much for your remarks, assembly member. Uh, finally, uh, we'll hear from the congresswoman on climate investments within the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so yeah, I now invite the Congresswoman to give her remarks. 
Thank you so much, Diego. Really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining our April Town Hall. Um, one of the reasons, and also thank you so much uh, to Assembly Members Mamdani and Burjos for, um, for joining us today. I think one of the big reasons why it's been important for us to make sure that we got some perspective from members in both our Bronx and Queens delegations in the state legislature is because one of the most active things that are happening right now that impacts all of us are the ongoing negotiations of the New York state budget. Now, as, as um, Assemblymember Mamdani had mentioned, the budget was due on April 1st and it is now April 13th. And so it's been running over um, a little bit um, in order to really figure out and settle our differences uh, between the governor and the legislature on some of these issues. And so what we've really uh, thought was very important is for you all to hear in real time what are the issues that are getting decided on right now as they are happening so that you have the opportunity to advocate before it's too late uh, on the issues that are important to you. And so as far as, as some of those top issues, we've heard from both of them, both on some of the details about what's happening uh, with bail reform. We're, we're seeing what uh, the movement that's been created on, um, on good cause eviction, which again is one of the really important measures that we are considering right now in order to prevent the absolute runaway ridiculous rents uh, that we have been dealing with across New York City and frankly across New York State. And that isn't even to include the rest of the country. And so really the idea of us um, starting to, to cap in a way rent increases at 3%. It doesn't ban them. It doesn't, it's not a hard cap, but it requires justification for increasing rents beyond that threshold. It's, you know, uh, measures like these, when you add them up, start to really add up to an overall environment where we can start really making our housing market and our housing situation in the city and across the state work for working class people. Um, and so we just want to give all the all the ups to uh, Assembly Members Mamdani and, and, um, and Kenny Burkos for joining us today um, because these updates are very, very important. And lastly, one of the updates that we also had heard about on the state level translate to some of the federal work that we've been doing. So we are in Earth Month right now and climate issues are front and center, uh, whether that is the Build Public Renewables Act that Assemblymember Mamdani spoke to or whether it's our upcoming reintroduction of the Green New Deal uh, that we will be doing in Washington, D.C. when I head back to D.C. Uh, next week. And so we're very excited about all of these developments. But one of the things that I wanted to touch on with you all today before we dive into our Q&A is uh, some of the tax credits and rebates that we're starting to see roll out as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act that Democrats passed last year. And despite it being called the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of this bill is very climate focused. Everything from overall uh, and broader infrastructure investments to really just dollars that you can get back into your pocket for purchases that you might be considering or making anyway um, that are climate friendly or efficient or energy efficient is, is really like those aspects are very important. And those are some of the things that we kind of wanted to cover uh, today and how you can benefit directly uh, right away and in the coming weeks and months, increasingly so on some of the things in that package. A lot of people may not know about uh, some of the benefits in the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we just kind of wanted to share some of those uh, with you today. So the first one on clean vehicles, uh, there is a $7,500 tax credit for new electric vehicles that are purchased under the IRA. They, they also provides a $4,000 uh, credit for used electric vehicles and electric cars. Um, that are also purchased under the Inflation Reduction Act. 
I will say that we fought really hard and we advocated to include micro mobility uh, devices and vehicles like e-scooters, e-bikes, and so on. However, the Senate did what the Senate does <laughs> and um, didn't really, you know, incorporate that language. But that doesn't mean that the fight on that is over. We will continue to make sure that we press for those advantages on alternatives because, frankly, EVs alone are not going to get us to where we need in terms of a climate solution, but they do play a very important role. And so if you are considering purchasing a new or used EV or car, um, there will be large credits for, um, for those who decide to pick up an electric vehicle. Secondly, there are major, major household investment credits and rebates. Uh, the rebates are, st are starting to come online by different states, and they, many of them are being implemented at a state level. Uh, but regardless, you can either write it off on your taxes or you will experience a direct discount and, and, or rebate right at the, at the register when you're purchasing some of these uh, climate eligible or efficiency eligible upgrades. Now, a lot of these investments are are very focused on households, but there are some that renters can also take advantage of as well. And we wanted to make sure to share some of that. Um, when it comes, I'll start with the household piece. When it comes to households, you, you can get a 30% credit on residential solar installations. So 30% off the overall price, that is huge. Um, so if you're considering installing solar, purchasing solar, or purchasing equipment, uh, these are these are purchases that would be eligible for major discounts. Additionally, if you're not ready to go to solar yet, you can also experience major discounts and rebates on, on other forms of energy efficient appliances. Things like heat pumps, window and door upgrades, winterization, all of that can have a very large discount. Additionally, depending on your income threshold, there are some upgrades that can be covered up to 50% or in some cases can be, uh, there can be credited in their entirety, uh, depending on the purchase and depending on your, uh, on your income level. If you are a renter, there are also ways that you can take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act as well. If you have the kind of relationship with your landlord um, and you're interested in, let's say, the stove or major appliances in your apartment are very outdated um, and you have a relationship with your landlord, very often these um, these appliances can be upgraded to energy efficient, efficient ones, including in things like induction uh, cooktops and you know, far more uh, that can that can be covered if you want to speak to your landlord about it. But even if you don't want to speak to your landlord about it, there are also um, certain portable appliances that you can also be eligible for if you're a renter. Even those very small induction cooktops uh, that you see that are one or two burners also have potential eligibility under the Inflation Reduction Act. And so these are all really important ways from smaller purchases all the way up through through EVs or your heat pump systems that can where you can really financially benefit a lot if you're aware about the IRA credits that were authorized last year. Lastly, for commercial buildings, there are also major tax deductions for efficient heating, cooling, ventilation, and lighting systems. So all of this uh, can be eligible for major, major financial benefit uh, directly to you all. And that comes again in those two uh, forms, either a rebate or a tax credit at the end of the year. Now for households, you, there are rebates for whole house retrofits, and there are also grants and loans available through uh, to HUD assisted housing for green retrofits. There's even expanded investment and eligibility for buildings if, um, if let's say there is a building that's all under one, one landlord. If just one of those apartments receives federally subsidized 
uh, housing or is eligible for federally subsidized housing, then the then that also unlocks a huge amount of eligibility for climate and efficiency related investments as well. Uh, there are there's also additional solar tax credits for low income households and uh, brownfield sites, which has pertained to our district and to our community. And for community based organizations, there are also environmental justice block grants, otherwise known as EJ block grants to reduce emissions, reduce pollution, build climate climate resilience and facilitate engagement with frontline communities. So if you are a grassroots climate uh, community or environmental justice community organizer or community organization, there's also a lot of eligibility uh, for you all as well. And we'd be happy to provide additional details um, and follow up. And you know, beyond the Inflation Reduction Act, we also kind of want to talk about how that fits within a broader context of a Green New Deal. The Inflation Reduction Act is a little bit of a, it, you know, there's a little bit of a paradox, a climate paradox. At once, it is both the largest climate action that the U.S. federal government has taken in American history, but it is at once the largest action and also still not sufficient for us to fully tackle the climate crisis that lies ahead of us. So it's a very important step, but it's also very important that we acknowledge that this is not a one and done deal. We have to keep at this. And so over the next year, my office is going to be working uh, very hard in advocating with the Biden administration to ensure that the Inflation Reduction Act is implemented with with in accordance with uh, Green New Deal principles. That includes um, making sure that we fight so that more of these benefits are available to renters and working class people, making sure that new jobs created by the Inflation Reduction Act are good paying, dignified union jobs. And then lastly, we are also pushing on new legislation with respect to healthcare, education, public transit, and more as we roll out additional Green New Deal planks. Um, and for you know those that have been wondering, the Green New Deal advocacy and legislating that we've been doing over the last year has been very impactful in the in the climate legislation that does pass Congress and has been signed by President Biden. In fact, many of the framing and and um, and the priorities in the Inflation Reduction Act were borrowed, or I would argue, were borrowed from the Green New Deal. Um, and not only that, but we served, and I had served on uh, President Biden's Climate Transition Task Force uh, as he was transitioning into the presidency, where we really hammered home the three core principles that we are looking for in climate legislation, which is, of course, decarbonization and making sure that we're doing that on an aggressive timeline, creation of good jobs, and environmental justice mitigate and really creating environmental justice and mitigating the injustices that communities like ours have experienced in the past. And so we're very, very excited about that. And with that, we're happy to dive into the Q&A. Um, I believe we still have Assemblymember Mamdani with us to answer state level questions, and I'll be here to answer federal level questions as well. Yeah, thanks so much, Congresswoman. Um, just as a reminder, um, those of you signed on via Zoom may use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Uh, just please mention what neighborhood you're from as we do prioritize our constituents from the New York 14th. That being said, um, the first question is for the Congresswoman from Wendy Cortez uh, from the Bronx. How can the FDA's expertise and procedures be protected from politicization? Yeah, so this, I'm so glad, uh, Wendy, that you brought this up because over the last week, we have seen major developments with respect to um, to abortion access that have really represented an egregious overstep by the courts. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think it's very important for us to communicate that we live in a government and a system of checks and balances. And that means that no one branch, that, that design of text and, uh, checks and balances is designed so that no one branch, whether it's the legislative, the executive, or the judiciary, really abuses their power and begins to overreach their power um, in a way that infringes on 
um, on the work of the other two branches. And so these three branches are actively checking and balancing one another. Historically, the courts have acted as a check on the legislature or the president in either overturning legislation or ruling on legislation if there is a lawsuit that is brought in court. However, um, and so what we're used to seeing are checks and balances, seeing the presidency or the executive checked or seeing, seeing the legislature checked. But what we've seen over the last 40 year assault on our, um, on our federal courts is particularly um, with last week's ruling, we are seeing rulings, we are seeing the full mask come off of, um, of an assault on our democracy using the courts. Uh, last week's ruling that was an attempt to ban uh, the production of mifepristone nationally really represents at its core the corruption that we have seen in our court system. And I want to explain to you why. It's not just because, and it's not the fact that this ruling happened at all, um, which of course the outcome of it is one that we vehemently disagree with, but it is the grounds upon which this judge and the grounds upon which this case was decided that really reveals the extent of the abuse of power available here. Mifepristone has been safely available on the market uh, for over 23 years. It was approved by the FDA over two decades ago and as such has been in the market. Now, what we're seeing is that right wing organizations started filing suits and they filed a suit in the circuit court of Texas where there is only one judge and where any federal lawsuit that is filed goes straight to that one judge. And what they did, and what they did, what Republicans did and what the right wing did is that when Trump was president and when, um, when Mitch McConnell had control of the Senate, they made approving extreme right wing and very often un completely unqualified people appointing them to the courts. There are records of, um, of judicial nominees and candidates that were deemed completely unqualified by the American Bar Association, which is nonpartisan and just looks at a at, looks at a nominee's experience. And they forced and approved some of these candidates uh, because they showed, in my assessment, uh, they showed a, a guarantee and a partisanship in how they want to rule. And what the anti-choice forced birth movement in the United States has done is that they know that they cannot win this fight in the court of public opinion. They know that they have lost uh, the, the public in support for banning abortion nationwide. And so they decided that their, that their way of trying to force their way in a democracy where the majority of the vast majority of people disagree with them was to try to capture our courts. And when you see the ruling of this judge in trying to ban uh, mifepristone nationwide, the first thing that he does is that in order to do that, he bans or tries to overrule the FDA's approval of a medicine. This is not something that a court or a judge has ever done before because judges are not doctors and the courts are not hospitals. The FDA is comprised of scientists, healthcare workers, researchers, and they have their own extremely rigorous testing process for the approval of any medicine, whether it's an abortifacent or whether it's Claritin. And for a judge to come out and overrule a medical uh, uh, approval process is unprecedented. It is a power grab that does not belong to the courts. This is a power, this is an example of a judge and the courts attempting to seize power that does not belong to them. Additionally, the grounds on which he provided this ruling are so reaching 
and so ridiculous that it actually makes a mockery of the law, it makes a mockery of our courts, and it makes a mockery of, of our overall system. And so when we talk about how um, the FDA expertise and procedures can be protected from this kind of politi politicization, um, I, I want to make clear what our position has been. And it may be surprising at first, but I wanna make sure that you know that there's grounds for this. We believe that the Biden administration should ignore this lawless ruling for several reasons. One, there is a competing ruling um, out of Washington state in the federal courts that actually mandates the Biden administration to continue to produce uh, mifepristone and to continue to allow the production and protect the production of mifepristone. And so you have two competing orders. In fact, there was that uh, another order kind of came out just today, a few hours ago, directly citing um, the Fifth Circuit ruling that, that tried to overturn it, saying even with respect to this specific ruling, the Biden administration must retain uh, that production. So when you have two conflicting court orders, then the enforcement discretion goes to the Biden administration. And we are advocating for ignoring um, that Texas ruling in order to comply with the secondary ruling, which would allow the continued production of mifepristone in the United States. But this is why fighting back against court overreach is so important. Because if we do nothing, and if the administration does nothing, or if the party does nothing, then more and more authority is going to get concentrated in an unelected, undemocratic, deeply partisan, and as we've seen with what happened with Clarence Thomas, corrupted. I mean, what we are seeing is corruption um, and that seizing uh, authority over our everyday decisions. We cannot allow that to happen. Um, and it's very, very important that we act as a check on the judiciary when the judiciary starts getting out of control. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, the next question is for Assemblymember Mamdani, and it comes from Helen uh, Sindrowski, and please apologize if I uh, mispronounce your name. Um, so she says, rather than eliminating bail, why not fix the court system so defendants get speedy trials, spend money to increase judges and have night court, weekend court, uh, because court only seems to be in session four to five hours a day. Thank you so much for, for, for that question. I think just to, to clarify right now what the fight is that I am a part of um, is in opposing any additional rollbacks that the governor is, is proposing. So we passed bail reform in 2019. There were rollbacks in 2020, just months after it was implemented. Then again last year, and now once again, the governor is proposing additional, and you know, they're called rollbacks, but frankly, they're attacks on civil rights. Um, I think that, you know, to your point, one of the um, criticisms that has been made about our criminal legal system is on the courts. And so the governor and her executive budget proposed additional funding for prosecutors to comply with discovery demands. We have heard these demands um, made by local prosecutors, but these are also issues that we've heard from our public defenders because we need to make sure that both sides of the law, both the accused and the accuser, are receiving the same amount of, of um, support from the state in being able to have a fair trial. And so what the legislature has done in our one house proposals, which for those who are not as familiar with Albany, means the assembly and the Senate each put together their own budget proposal. In those one house budget proposals, we have proposed not simply funding for prosecutors, but also for local public defenders, so that um, all can have the, the, the funding that is necessary to comply with these kinds of discovery demands. The governor has taken a totally different tack to it, which is that we should just completely gut these discovery reforms entirely. That is not the, the, the way that we should move forward. We passed those discovery laws as part of our attempt to ensure that never again would someone like Khalif Browder lose their life on the accusation that they stole a backpack and then spend three years on Rikers Island and then take their own life afterwards because of the trauma inflicted upon them um, for that time period. The other point I would just add 
Uh, there are a number of um, courts that actually do operate at night as well. I think in Brooklyn there is there is night court, um, but it is absolutely an issue, and it is one that I will be carrying with me to Albany about how do we ensure that people can actually have their right to a speedy trial? Because I visited Rikers uh, over a week ago now, and I met individuals there who had been on Rikers without getting to a trial for more than a year, more than two years, sometimes more than three years. And that is fundamentally wrong, that we have New Yorkers who are still innocent in the eyes of the law, and yet they are spending their time, to quote the Congresswoman, in one of the worst sites of human, of, of, um, of, of a human rights crisis across our country, and it's happening right in our backyard. Thanks so much, Assembly Member. Um, this next question is for the Congresswoman, and it's from someone from Castle Hill. And they say, can you speak on the development of electric vehicle charging infrastructure in the South and Central Bronx? All of the city's current EV charging pilot stations are in the North Bronx, and EV adoption will not be possible for most Bronx residents until accessible charging is available borough-wide and citywide. We need charging in Castle Hill, Parkchester, Soundview, Mount, Mount Haven, etc. Yes, yeah, so I am in complete agreement as someone who has had an EV in the Bronx, has an EV and um, needed to charge. Literally, what I am able to do is um, from Parkchester, I drive to, I've driven to Bay Plaza, and that's the only charger um, that's available in a pretty wide area. If it's not the only charger in the Bronx, it's one of the only chargers in the Bronx. And so EV infrastructure and charging infrastructure is very, very important to adoption. Um, this is something that we are looking at because not just the Inflation Reduction Act, but also uh, with, with previous infrastructure legislation that we've worked on, uh, there is authorization and funding to expand EV charging networks. And so this is something that we are actively, um, have, this is something we've been actively diving into to make sure that we can get that federal money into underinvested communities. Because if we don't do that, and this is the point that we've been raising both with the Biden administration, but also on a more granular, granular level with the Department of Transportation and, and others, is that if we do not intervene to affirmatively and aggressively invest um, in EV charging infrastructure in underserved communities, then what we're already starting to see is this EV charging infrastructure mostly being built in more affluent places. And that will just perpetuate the harm of the toxic air pollution that we're seeing. The South Bronx has some of the highest childhood asthma rates um, in the United States, if not the world. And a lot of that, almost the, a huge proportion of that, has to do with um, with vehicles, with vehicle emissions and trucking emissions constantly going through the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Bruckner and so many of our highways um, and industrial areas. And so this is something that we are on, uh, believe us, and um, we are working. Uh, but the link here and the important thing is making sure that that advocacy happens at the city, state, and federal level because we need to have our city council members uh, really pushing for this uh, for this kind of infrastructure. I have tried the street charging infrastructure um, in Brooklyn, and there are some in in, uh, in pockets of Queens as well. And it's very effective when it works well. Um, and so we have to make sure that we expand that equitably because it's not acceptable for it to get into every borough except ours. Thanks so much, Congresswoman. Um, this next question is for Assemblymember Mamdani and it comes from Sonia Rodriguez from Parkchester. And she says, when will the state budget include uh, repaving our streets as there are lots of cracks and holes creating potential accidents, especially for, for the elderly? Thank you so much, Sonia, for that question. Um, and before I answer it, I wanna say Parkchester is lovely and has some of the best Bengali food that I've ever had, Nirup, great restaurant. Um, but to your question, um, it is of immense concern, you know, to make sure that, that our streets are safe. And one of the things that has been proposed in the budget that we're still finalizing in Albany, um, the governor proposed about $578 million 
for um, you know highway improvement programs as well as for local road programs. The legislature has, has proposed going $200 million above that. There's also funding that has come from the federal government, from our partners like the Congresswoman and others, um, about $2 billion towards that kind of maintenance. And then in New York State's Department of Transportation, there's a five-year program that has about $6 billion towards local road maintenance, um, as well as other things of, of infrastructure. I think, you know, another point that I would just make, in, in addition to potholes, um, specifically to your point about the elderly, one of the other things we need to do to make our streets safer is to change the streetscape entirely. Um, you know, there needs to be uh, speed bumps, there needs to be infrastructure that actually calms the roadway. Um, that also includes protected bike lanes because we have far too many of our constituents losing their lives to traffic violence. You know, I am the representative of Astoria and Long Island City. There's a 16 year old boy who lost his life just two days ago, biking home um, and, and he was hit by a car and there was, you know, there was no bike lane in, in that street. Um, so this is of immense concern to many of us. There's, there's, as you can see, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars being put towards the maintenance of this. Um, but I think we also need to move towards making sure that we have safer investments as well as just maintenance. And the last point I would just make is that we also want to fight to ensure that for people to get around New York City, they can rely on public transit as opposed to having to have a car. And that is also one of the, the major animating ideas around our, our fight to fix the MTAs is we have to, when someone wants to get to Parkchester, from Parkchester to Astoria, they can believe in taking a bus to taking a train frequent enough. Um, because right now that's not the case. And if you want it to be, it's still on the table. You can go to fixthemta.org and you can write a letter to the governor. We've sent more than 3,700 letters so far and you could get us to 4,000. Thanks so much for, uh, for your answer, Assembly Member. Uh, this next question is for the Congresswoman and it comes from Sonia Diaz Argon from Co-op City. She asks, is there anything that your office can do to help 250,000 NYC retirees? This new IETNA plan will cost us valuable time waiting for approvals. Yes, so thank you so much for your question, Sonia. Um, for those who may not be familiar, uh, her question is alluding to this big shift uh, among city employees, especially retirees, but really employees uh, and city workers from Medicare to Medicare Advantage. And this is a very big deal. Um, you may see ads on television about Medicare Advantage and what that is and trying to get you to switch to it. And, you know, everybody is entitled to their own decisions. However, um, I am in agreement with you, Sonia, that this shift um, after people have already worked, after they've already put in their time, after they've already built up, you know, their their whole work experience, their pensions, what have you, to switch from Medicare to Medicare Advantage is, I think, um, on behalf of um, almost a quarter million New York City retirees, I think is a bad decision. It is not good. Um, Medicare Advantage has a lot of very concerning aspects to it. And while on paper, oftentimes it is billed or seen as something superior or better, um, what you're trading off in the short term, where it may be a little bit more affordable on that monthly payment, you are giving up in the long term with overall coverage and care. And every, almost, virtually every single one of us will, will, just as a matter of life, will encounter or have an experience where we need to seek medical care, whether short-term or ongoing, at a hospital. And where Medicare Advantage becomes a concern is that you may have that more affordable monthly payment, but a lot more of those costs are going to get moved on to you and moved on to our seniors and retirees in a shift to Medicare Advantage. And so this is a shift that I oppose, that I've publicly opposed. We are advocating against it. Um, and you know we're lucky in a way in the state of New York because say you are not one of the city worker retirees that are involved in this particular negotiation, but if you decide that you switch to Medicare, that you wanna go from Medicare to Medicare Advantage, in many states, that decision is virtually a permanent one. 
And it, once you switch to Medicare Advantage, which is, by the way, it is, it is managed by a private insurer. And that's what, that is why this is often very concerning. Regular Medicare is administered by the federal government. Your, you know, your medications, for example, we just authorized um, overall negotiating, uh, we're allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices so that they can be lower for you, et cetera. That is the, that is the result of a direct publicly managed system. Medicare Advantage is privately managed. So you get insurers like United Healthcare or Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield that will then manage your Medicare for you. Um, and that is what Medicare Advantage is. And very often we have seen huge problems with this. Of the top 10 administers of Medicare Advantage, I believe half of them have been accused of fraud by the United States government and eight in 10 have submitted inflated bills. And so what often gets marketed around Medicare Advantage is that they try to sell you on, on this lower premium, you get more, you, you end up paying far more than what you save on that premium in terms of what they saddle on you in inflated bills and, and over costs. In fact, some of um, the, you know, some of the data that we've seen has been shocking. United Healthcare and other major uh, insurers, this is a cash cow for them. It is very profitable. And, and that has to do with the gap between what they're claiming and what they're billing versus what is what it's costing them. With public systems like Medicare, it is not designed for profit. And so what you're so you are paying more in alignment with the value that you're getting as opposed to you paying for this much and getting this much. And so it's really important that we protect Medicare. We are in this fight. We have actually elevated this fight. Uh, you know, what is seen and what has historically been seen as a city issue uh, around this, I have been elevating as well as some other members. I've been working with Congressman Jerry Nadler, for example, on um, the West Side, or I guess Midtown after redistricting, um, about raising this to the federal level. And I signed alongside uh, 70 other Democrats in Congress. We have um, sent letters to the Biden administration urging them uh, to make changes on this. And also we've been drawing attention to the overall Congressional Progressive Caucus about what is happening in New York. Um, but I want you all to know that we are in this fight with you. Do not give up. There needs to be pressure. And by the way, that needs to be both electorally and also in having those conversations with your union. These are folks that are at the negotiating table and there has to be accountability. And, and so I would highly encourage um, you know, you to, to make your views known both within your union that is making some of these decisions at that negotiating table with the city, as well as your city elected officials. But we are in this fight with you and we also oppose that shift. Thanks so much, Congresswoman. Um, the last question of the night is for both the Congresswoman and for Assemblymember uh, Mamdani. It comes from Alexander Schaefer uh, from Astoria. And he asks, um, there are no current public transit projects that will have a material impact on our lives. IBX will not reach Astoria. The Great 21st bus lane isn't being expanded or replicated elsewhere. What transit projects are you pushing for in the district? Great. Um, I can start off or Zofran, if you want to start off. Okay, I'll dive right into it. Um, so one thing that I do want to say is that there are things happening with transit and public access in Astoria. Um, however, when we look at overall of our district, um, it, compared to other communities, access to public transit uh, is less of the issue in Astoria in terms of density, right? We have subway stations that run through. We need expansion on bike lanes, as Zofran was, was uh, talking about, and also a lot of pedestrian um, investments that we are working on as well. But, you know, you contrast that, for example, with other areas like East Elmhurst, where 
you're looking at a 30 or 40 minute walk to a subway station, depending on uh, where, you know, where the neighborhood you are. So we have both access to public transit and also investments in public transit. I want to be clear that there are investments being made in a story around public transit, particularly around um, ADA accessibility, which is so desperately needed. So we're starting to see improvements and new projects uh, launching everywhere from, I believe, the Broadway station, the Steinway station, um, Queensboro Plaza, as well as many others to expand ADA accessible or ADA accessibility um, to those subway stations. We're also, one of the things that we've been doing is that in the whole air train debacle um, one or two years ago, we were working behind the scenes because one of the reasons that we opposed the air train was not just the construction and, and, um, and all that, you know, the way that the project was designed, but because we felt that alternatives had not been sufficiently explored. That includes everything from you know, the, the, the lower lift stuff from installing more and uh, focusing on having dedicated bus lanes through Astoria to connect Astorians to LaGuardia Airport much more quickly, all the way up to seriously considering and raising the possibility of extending um, our subway lines on the NQ in order to get us to uh, to extend it from Astoria and get direct subway access to LaGuardia Airport. And so these are very real things that are on the table. Granted, these are large projects, but we want to make sure that we start, um, start, you know, getting the ball rolling as well. Some of the other advocacy that we've been involved in is that as of January, the Penn Access stations, those the additional MTA stations that are getting added, all four of the new Penn Access stations are now in our congressional district. Now, those are on the Bronx half of the district, but we have advocated for in, in the secondary phases of this access project, considering uh, adding these types of stations in Astoria and some of that expanded MTA access as well. So those are some of the things that we've been working on. Um, again, bus lanes, we recently secured two major uh, community projects in Astoria, and one of them is uh, uh, in Astoria Boulevard to make sure that we also increase the pedestrian uh, safety measures that are there because some of these intersections are very dangerous. Um, to cross. And we want to make sure that we're also making investments uh, to make it much safer, uh, not just to take the subway, but also to bike and to walk. Yeah, and I would really um, very much echo what the Congresswoman has said. And I think especially that grant that the Congresswoman secured for 31st Street and Astoria Boulevard, that is an extremely dangerous intersection. And it is simply put just traffic violence waiting to happen. And I think that that million dollars will really go a long way towards creating the kind of streetscape that we need. Um, I would also add, you know, when we look at public transit systems across the world, we've seen time and again that the best method to use from an airport into a municipality is a single ride. And yet what we've seen time and time again in New York City is this New York City is exceptional and we should have an air train and that air train might have to go backwards for you to then go forwards. And we've seen what an air train does in, in, with JFK. The price goes up. I think now it's even north of eight dollars. It is yeah. fundamentally ridiculous. And I think that. The idea of extending the NW from Dipmars um, going to LaGuardia is something that we do need to actually consider. And, and you know, in, in recent reports, they've said it might be too expensive to do so. We also have to ask ourselves go through construction for transit projects. And I think one of the reasons is because of the overwhelming cost of dealing with consultants. Right with the Second Avenue subway, the MTA spent more money on consultants than they did on construction, and so that is something we need to reform internally in terms of the hollowing out of public capacity. Um, and also, we have legislation as part of our Fix the MTA package that would reduce capital construction costs by putting more of the responsibilities on private utilities like Con Ed and Verizon, who use these moments as excuses to get their own infrastructure done. Um, and the second thing that I would say is. You know, initially what we had with the regional plans proposal of the Interborough Express is that it actually would come to Astoria. In what the governor proposed, it ends in Jackson Heights. I think, you know, we're still many years from that coming to fruition. 
that is hopefully enough time for us to get Astoria back to the table because there's no reason why we should be locked out of that. Um, but I really do appreciate the question and the urgency because we desperately need to get back to a time when New York City was building out, and really leading um, in terms of public transit infrastructure. And it's, it's such a pleasure to be working with a congresswoman who is taking, you know, le le really leading that fight in Washington, D.C., and trying to make sure that we can get the funds for what we need over here. Thank you so much, Assembly Member, and thank you so much to the Congresswoman. And um, thank you to all of you, all of our constituents, for asking questions and, you know, making sure that you make your voice heard. Um, just a reminder, you can always contact our office by calling 718-662-5970, and that's uh, for the Congresswoman's office. Um, but really, thank you so much for our constituents for joining us. Your engagement is what allows us to continue to fight and to push uh, to you know, secure a better future and secure a better life. Uh, I also want to take our transcribers, Cara Camacho and John Trujillo, and I want to thank, I extend a thank you to our interpreters, uh, Carly Ayaliz, Lisa Dene, Anais Velasquez Garay, and Ruben Martinez. Again, just want to reiterate, you can always uh, contact our offices by calling 718-662-5970. And with that, thank you all so much for attending and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy this summer evening, this early summer preview. <laughs>